Today we're going to talk about and break down the body language of Sandra Dorley. Uh, yeah, Dorley. She is the DA of Rochester County, New York. And she got pulled over. And like Chase was saying earlier before we got started, we're seeing some very authentic body language here. It's rare that you see it this authentic. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to watch. Let's clear this up. She is the DA. The DA. Oh, like that's right. That. I forgot. <laughs> so don't forget that she's the DA and she refused to pull over when a police officer caught her doing 55 and a 35 and drove on home. And we'll start when he gets out of the car. Sorry, I'm the DA. I was going 55 coming home from work. 55 and a 35. I don't really care. Okay. okay. So you can call this. Can you come, can you no, please no, come no. over here? No. You're on a, this is on a traffic stop, ma'am. Yes, it is. You can call Dennis Kohlmeyer right now. Okay. I'm telling you why I stopped you. You didn't stop at all. Did you not hear my lights or sirens or no, anything? No, I didn't, actually. I was on the phone. Okay. Well, you're not supposed to be on the phone while you're driving either. Yes, I am. With the hands-free, absolutely. Okay. Why are you so upset at me? I'm doing my job. No, you you just admitted to me that you were going 55 and a 35 can on Phillips Road. Can you to leave me alone? It's... Officer Chris Afoli. Can you stay over here, ma'am? You're this no, is a traffic I'm not this is a this is a legal here. traffic stop. Do you have your ID? No, it's in my purse. Here. You have your purse right there. No, this is my lunch. Would you talk to your talk to Dennis? This is ridiculous. Just go away. Hello, sir. Good. Ma'am, can you please stay at the back? Can this is a le ma'am, this is this legal is traffic stop. stop. Can you please stay over here? No. no. Hey baby, get your little guy out of here. Sir. I stopped her for going 55 and a 35 on Phillips Road, on Phillips Road. and Coming she failed to stop. She drove all the way back home and parked oh, in her garage, and now she's not she's not complying with any of my commands. Ma'am, do not go inside. Oh, my God. All right, Greg, what do you got? So she starts off her very first defense is going to be a rational actor. And she's going to be, look, I, I, I'm the DA. She's going to be very calm. Watch her. She goes and she uses exaggerated vowels as she says, I don't care, real long drawn out. And she kind of strikes that off, that that uh, pose, whatever she's doing with her right hand there. She looks like John Travolta from Saturday Night Fever or something, throwing her hand up as she says it, like, get out of here. She's got demonstrative body language. But the whole thing she's doing here is saying, I am the DA. I'm the DA. Not that that matters. This guy's doing his job. And so she gets more and more defiant with him as he goes. She's got an excited, these eyes that open wide in defiance. And we'll get to see a baseline of her later where her eyes are not doing that. When she's defiant, she does the piercing eye movement and opens her eyes very wide. I've seen that a lot of times when somebody's trying to convince me of something. Um, then she goes, I, no, I didn't. I was actually on the phone. I didn't see you. I was actually on the phone. Well, then how can you tell me that you knew you were going 55 when he first pulled you over? Clearly, the two things won't mesh. If you're saying, look, I am, I was doing 55, then you know when the lights came on. You know when he was pulling over. And she comes outside, she has the phone as a barrier, and she does something I call egg protector, where we call the fig leaf what men do when they cross primary sex organs. Women cross your uterus with your arm and ovaries, and that's a that's a protection. That's a barrier. And then she does an eye roll and breaks eye contact and annoyance. Whatever he's saying doesn't matter. I, she should have just held up her hand and said, just be quiet, because that's what she just did with her body language. She's gripping that barrier. And then she goes back into the car. Here's a piece of advice for you. If you get pulled over, don't go back in the car and dig in a bag unless you want to be tased or worse. That's a real opportunity for that cop to take this out on her. Let us say this about things. When we're talking about anything we see in body language, we're using our life of experience, whether that's in the interrogation room interviewing people in corporate America, interacting with thousands and thousands of people, and then applying our life experience over it. So each of us may have minor differences in what we see, and you may have minor differences if you had more experience, for example, a police officer will see something different than a, a, an average person. So it's an important part of what we do. And even in my system of read, review, evaluate, analyze, and decide, I always say, you'll come up with a different solution based on context that you may understand that don't. Chase, what do you got? Yeah. I agree. I totally agree. And as a quick PSA to police departments, those numbers on the bottom left of the screen are GPS coordinates of the body camera that show the location within 10 feet. So blurring out a license plate and address is great for privacy, but anybody could type these into Google Maps and it goes to that driveway specifically. And there's no uh, 
shaking in her hands that I would I might expect to see no indication that she's even remotely worried about being stopped, which seems to indicate she's extremely confident in two things. She didn't do anything wrong. Or number two, she is so important that the law doesn't apply to her and this is not a big deal. So either way, uh, this is very revealing of some character here. She's hesitant to step out of the garage. You can see her looking left and right. She's hyper aware of the potential for the neighbors to be watching what's going on at this point. And when people are in situations where they feel superior and they feel that the person they're talking to has nothing to offer them, that's when true character comes out. When somebody's talking to a waiter, for example, you can see how they treat a waiter when they think nobody's looking. Uh, how someone treats a waiter who they might see is not directly beneficial to their personal goals can be very telling. Do they show respect and kindness or do they dismiss and belittle? The, uh, this behavior is a powerful indicator of the true nature because it's free from the usual filters that we apply when we think that we have something to gain. And I think it's these unguarded moments that show us whether or not a person practices respect and empathy as a core value or as just tools to be used when they're beneficial. So as of now, I'm seeing some things that would make me think I would not want to be near this person in real life. And also uh, with the blurring of the video, the license, the entire license plate is visible five times in this in the video here. Scott, what do you got? <laughs> I can't believe he said all that about that dude. That's 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 so funny. I can't hardly really stand it about the blurring of the uh, deaths above. <laughs> okay, I agree with everything you said, and um, what we're seeing is this is the behavior of a giant baby, a giant baby that's a narcissist, and I'll show you why because we see everything a baby does. A little child, we're going to see her do. Everything from stomping to cussing to getting real loud, trying to get her way, not listening to anything, trying to overtake the conversation. I'm the one in charge. She thinks that her attitude is, I know all because I am all. That's what babies are. That's what that's what a giant baby narcissist would do. That's how they would see the world. And when she says, when he says, you're going 55 and a 35, she says, I don't care. I don't care. She's the district district attorney. If you get a ticket over there and you have to go see, talk about it, that's who you go see. That's who prosecutes your your ticket. She's the one that, in other words, that gets after you and says, "Okay, well, here's She'll what happened." Point that here's out. Happen. Do what? She'll oh, point I know. That out. Oh, I know. <laughs> but oh yeah, and oh yeah, she sure does. And she should know that. So we can't get we can't give her a pass on this. We can't let that go. We never talk about these beforehand, but today we couldn't help but talk about this one a little bit. And Mark's got a real good take on on the speed limit thing there. That I think that I thought it was hilarious, but true. So she says, and and her her go to is, I'm calling Dennis Colmeyer right now, and that's his, that's their uh, chief of police there. Chief. It's Dennis, Dennis Colmeyer apparently. So she's on the she's calling the chief of police. She's put herself in above everybody so much so with the, with the chief of police that she's going to call him and get this taken care of. I, 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 so, and then she gives him the phone. Says, and in other words, here's your boss. Now go away. You know, talk to him. Just trying to get, you know, like, I'm, t I'm too good to talk to you. You're out there first responding to anything that happens. If somebody had come to her house and was shooting and setting it on fire, whatever, he's going to show up and try to stop that and catch the person doing it. Right. And she's treating him like that. And, and you'll also see during this, there's a, a part where, uh, over the radio comes a call about a little child having a seizure, a 14 year old child. And they're here having to deal with her when they could be out there helping with things like that. You know, so this, this I don't like this woman in the least. I'm going to go ahead and say it. I'm, I may be a little bit biased on this, but when you start treating the police officers like that, the people that would die for you, literally, they do it every day. No, no, I'm not, I'm not into it. I'm not into it. She's heard a thousand times somebody say, I didn't hear the, the lights and siren when a cop was following him. And that's their excuse. Really? And you know, she said, you got to be kidding me. That's a police car. We know you saw it because everybody sees a police car. When the sirens go off, you heard it. You saw it. You can't help but see it. So, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not into her. A, a giant baby narcissist, 
No. I did, this gets on my last nerve. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, let's see what I got here. Uh, look, there's a reason that you have a 35 um, uh, kilometer, I guess it's kilometers or it's miles in the US. I can't miles. remember. Miles. Okay, 35 miles an hour uh, limit. It's usually because there's a built up area there, which means there's pedestrians likely and usually little kids, you know, and you're, you're trying to stop people uh, moving so fast that they won't be able to break in time if a kid runs out into the road or somebody walks out into the road. It's it's a social convention. It's kind of less of a law, though it is the law. It's more about a social convention. And what that's trying to do is, is save other people's lives. So saying, like, I don't care, well, that means you don't care about other people's lives, essentially. You don't care about that 20 miles an hour more that that is designed to stop other people being killed. It's not trying to curtail your liberty in any way. It's trying to save other people. It's a social convention. And some social conventions, you have if you're part of society, you have to join in with understanding. It's not trying to limit me. It's trying to help other people. I'm not just me on my own. I'm a part of society. I'm a part of a group. Unless you don't think you're part of society and you don't think you're part of a group, and that would be antisocial. And let's come to that in a moment, because we've got somebody uncompliant, irate, maybe irrational, uh, potentially completely unreasonable here. Now, why is that? It could be emotion. It could be emotion. And if it is emotion, that's most likely to change or wear off over about 10 minutes because it's heightened emotion. It can't sustain for very, very long. The person isn't used to having that level of uncompliance or rationality or unreasonableness. So it, it'll transform into somebody else or it'll it's something else or it'll wear off. Let's see if that happens. Could be drugs or alcohol. That can do the same thing to people. We can check out whether it's any of that. It could be what we call an affective disorder, which means kind of like an emotion, but it's with them forever. Or it could be a mood. So a mood would come before affective disorder. They're in a bit of a mood at the moment, though quite irrational for a level of mood. Could be affective disorder, though, which means it, it could be lasting for months or years at a time. Or it could be, as you're suggesting there, Scott, a personality disorder. Uh, and, and from what I'm seeing in terms of uh, not agreeing with the usual moves of society, an antisocial personality disorder, um, to which narcissism would actually fit in with, as, as I understand it. So, you know, could be a fair, a very fair comment there, uh, Scott, from what I see. Now, here's what I see in the body language. We get this lip retraction here and pressed together just before she brings the phone to her mouth. That's anger. For sure, in my book, that's ang literally in some of my books. That's ang that's anger. <laughs> so, so, and I think over time we're going to see some of the other indicators of that. So, Greg, I think to your point that she is, you know, to some to some extent, kind of put together at the moment, though still irrational and un uncompliant. She's kind of put together. We're starting to see the emotion start to creep out. How much will it escalate during this? That's going to be uh, interesting, but certainly something really quite antisocial going on here, which, which is interesting for somebody who has a job, which is a social job. The DA is part of an important part of society. So this could be, this could get quite ironic, I can see. Sorry, I'm the DA. I was going 55, coming home from work. 55 and a 35. I don't really care. Okay. So you can call this. Can you, come, can you no, please no, come no. over here? No. You're on a, this is on a traffic stop, ma'am. Yes, it is. You can call Dennis Kohlmeyer right now. Okay. I'm telling you why I stopped you. You didn't stop at all. Did you not hear my lights or sirens or no, anything? No, I didn't actually. I was on the phone. Okay. Well, you're not supposed to be on the phone while you're driving either. Yes, I am. With the hands-free, absolutely. Okay. Why are you so upset at me? I'm doing my job. Yeah, you you just admitted that. to me that you were going 55 and a 35 on Phil's Road. Can you to leave me alone? It's Christa Officer Chris Afouli. Can you stay over here, ma'am? This no, is a traffic. I'm not this is a, staying over This is a legal here. traffic stop. Do you have your ID? No, it's in my purse. Here. You have your purse right there. No, this is my lunch. Would you talk to your talk to Dennis? This is ridiculous. Just go away. Hello, sir. Good. Ma'am, can you please stay at the back? You, this is a le ma'am, this is legal traffic stop. Can you please stay over here? No. No. Hey baby, get your little guy out of here. Sir, 
I stopped her for going 55 and a 35 on Phillips Road. On Phillips Road. And Come she failed to stop. She drove all the way back home and parked oh, in her garage. Go, and now she's not she's not complying with any of my commands. Ma'am, do not go inside. Oh, my God. So he's showing off there that he's got an office door. Showing off with your new place there. <laughs> yeah, man. Gotta, you, gotta shut your door. Your fancy doors. Yeah. You gotta shut my office door. Don't think I don't have doors. I got hey, doors. shut my door that's made of oak and glass. Really well, whatever. Things. Whatever. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. All right. Ma'am, come outside. You can't just go inside. This is a traffic yes, stop. Here's yes, your phone back. I understand the law better than you. Would you just 953, you can just you have a law? supervisor come to the scene? No. Get out of my fucking house. I don't, know why, I don't know why you're acting like this towards me. Because can you please go to the back of the vehicle? I'm not going to. I'm home. I was going... I was, okay, 50. I don't care if you got home. You were supposed to stop at Phillips Road when I pulled you over. I when my know. lights were initiated. I didn't know you were stopping me. There was lots of other people on the road. I was right behind you. Yeah, there were I, other people on the road, too. Okay, I was directly I'm behind not, you. I'm not dealing with you right Can now. Can you please step over here? I'm not going to. What is the reason you're, you're so against what I'm doing? I'm doing my job. You say you're a DA? I am the DA. Okay. Okay, let me get you my badge. I am the DA in, of New York County. I just don't understand the hostility towards me. I'm doing my job. No, you're being an asshole. How am I being an asshole? I am the DA in Monroe County. I understand yes, that, but I'm that doesn't give you a right to I go to... 55 and a 35. And you even admitted to me that you went 50. I understand I really that, care. ma'am. I don't really I understand care. that. I don't, you know what? If you give me a traffic ticket, that's fine. I'm the one who prosecutes it, okay? Just go ahead and do it. Go ahead. Okay. I just don't understand the hostility. I, I understand no, you're coming home from work. Making, and half the time I was on the phone with Dennis telling him, why are you pulling me over? You're not even supposed to be on the phone to begin with. You oh, should yes. know that. Oh, 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 oh. I'm hands-free? Absolutely. Okay. You should know the law. Okay. If it is hands-free, that's great. But at the end of the day, you're going 55 and a 35. That's 20 okay. miles over the speed limit. Okay. You know what? That's fine. You know what I've been dealing with all day? Three murders in the city. And do you think I really care if I was going 20 miles over the speed limit? Okay, I'm just doing my I job. If you, pulled, the, if you pulled over when you saw my lights, which obviously you did. I thought you were going somewhere else because I okay. thought no one would ever pull a, a black SUV if you ran my plates. I didn't I run your plate. I just called your plate out. And then I'm following you because you're not stopping. So I had to take the air from dispatch. Just please. 953, you can have the air back, by the way. All right, Chase, what do you got? When she says, I know more about the law than you do, uh, this reminds me of something I overheard once driving through the gate of the amphibious warfare base here in Virginia. I was riding with a fellow chief uh, who kind of used his rank a little bit on the guy that was guarding the gate. And this young sailor on watch at the gate says, and I quote, don't confuse your rank with my authority. <laughs> I love and that. Oof. It, it was so good. So That's good. nice. <laughs> so the officer is being kind and explaining way more than he's required to explain. And I think that's a bad thing that's gotten into a lot of people now. Like, I need to explain everything to these people. But he's also defending his actions. He's explaining himself, but he's also matching her volume and her tone. And he's essentially getting into an argument. And I admire this guy's composure. But in this instance, keep in mind that two people who have never met will automatically and unconsciously decide who is the leader in that interaction. And this will almost always come down to two factors. Number one is the person who is least reactive to the other person. And number two is the person with the most composure. Keep that in mind, uh, not just for this video, but for your for your whole life. So then she, you see her arm on the hip here. And in the initial body language book, the first one ever written by a guy named Julius Fast, this was called an anti-embrace posture. 
because it made you harder to hug. So that's how they they described it. And there's a lot of body language here, but let's look at behavior. We're seeing a behavioral pattern, which is not an aberration. These moments of interactions like this, when people think they're not being watched, tend to show more authenticity than anything else. We're seeing leveraging position, attempting to gain sympathy, trying to use authority, reminding the officer that she's superior in status and in knowledge. There's a feeling uh, that the law is applicable to other people and not her. She's finally rationalizing and minimizing her actions. And I wonder if she would let somebody off of charges who gave the same excuses that she did. And if you don't think so, then you get an even deeper peek into a fully authentic worldview that should be pretty scary. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, well, it's an interesting worldview, isn't it? Because she's in public office. My my assumption is the DA is a public office. You're paid elected. by yeah. yeah, yeah, and elected. Okay, so elected public office. If I had been publicly elected, it is my assumption that I'm on public view all the time all the time. So what has to happen in my head to forget that or not realize that in the first place? What does my head need to be like for me to suddenly go, um, I'm not being watched by anybody. There's a police officer. I don't think they'll have a camera. So I can be whoever I like, and there will be no ramifications for this. She's lost all understanding of the situation that she's in right now, that for me is a pretty dangerous for somebody who has public office of that nature to so quickly forget who she is and, and where she is. And, and who's she being right now? Well, hands on hips there, Chase, just as you say. I mean, it, it is non-huggable because you've now got these sharp, pointy things defending yourself. It's quite kind of quite prehistoric. But also it gives you bigger upper body um, or the or the look of that. So it, I always call it the the gesture of I'm bigger than you thought I was, because if somebody if somebody's walking around this all all the time, you know, then that's a bit of a baseline. But she wasn't doing that all the time. There comes a point where she has to keep saying to him, "I'm larger than you think. I'm more impressive than you might be thinking right now." So we got that going on. We've got more of that lip compression of anger. We've also got this this brow starting to come in here as well. That's anger as well. We've got these um, these eyes targeting as well. That's anger. We've got the brow beating, as you'd call it, I think, Greg, where the, the head is really kind of punishing the other person. There's lots of escalation of anger uh, right now. Um, listen, and, and she says... Um, uh, she she puts forward the idea that she's had to look at three homicides uh, today. And that's part of her idea of, you know, I've had a bad day and here's my excuse for this. Again, my assumption is if you go into the public office of DA, you're going to be looking at crime. Crime is not good. It's not nice. You know, there's all kinds of levels of it. You've got to assume that you're going to see bad stuff, maybe on a daily basis. And if you can't handle that, you should never put yourself up for election. Just shouldn't, because that's what you're going to see. And so you have to go into that going, I know what I'm going to see. I'd like you to elect me. I can handle this as well as what the speed limit is in built up areas. I can handle that as well. I'm the person for this job. She's giving us now all the reasons why she never should have been elected to this role. Greg, what do you got on this one? Well, apparently she has decades of experience in the DA role, and she has been, I believe, the president of the New York DA Association. So it's not new to her. She knows this, and Chase, that drives home your point even more. I love the fact she used a confusing authority with rank, because I'm going to add another confusing thing. People often, we use this word in our society the wrong way constantly. People are acting entitled no, they're acting as if their expectations are entitlements. There's a difference in the two. And even in relationships, often the breakdown, it occurs in business where a person has an expectation they believe is an entitlement. That's what we're seeing here. And because she believes that and because of the defiant thing she's doing with her with her creating a non-huggable skeleton and doing the eye blocking and driving her head forward and doing all that, that's absolute defiance because her expectations are not met. She even is belittling enough to say, 
I understand more about the law than you do. That may be true about the application, but about the policing, I would doubt that. He may be brand new, may be a rookie, may be that. I don't know. That doesn't matter. But a person who is applying the law on the streets, again, we're getting back to that read thing. That's a very different understanding of the law than a person who is deciding whether to prosecute or not. I have to capture people who are doing things. Clearly, one of them is a person driving 55 and a 35. And if you were just trying to pull them over and give them a ticket and they run for it, well, there's an approach that people take. She's demonstrative at I am the DA. She's crisper. Her body language is all congruent as if it, that's her entitlement, which is an entitlement. And then she does those Trump fingertips to put a finer point on it. She thinks the badge is going to save her and she pulls it out. Again, if you're in that situation and you go into your vehicle and turn your back on an officer, that's not a safe thing for you. It's not safe for him or her. So they have to think about you that way. It's how people get hurt all the time. She has her elbows away from her sides and her fingers are spread. That's confident that she feels like she's entitled to this. We're seeing a really big display of you violated my entitlements. They're not her entitlements. doesn't matter. And both of their brains are escalating. You hear a difference in pitch. Fight or flight has entered. And she's lost her rational actor description because now she's starting to – and she does absolute dismissal. And she has contempt in her face as she goes, you should know the law. I didn't do anything wrong here, and I don't care. That's an irrational defense from the rational defense before. So really weird to see it changing, but it's because of that. What we say today is entitlement, and I say is not entitlement. It's expectation parading as entitlement is what we're seeing. Scott, what do you got? You guys covered all the body language stuff. I got so worked up in the, in the last video, I forgot to point out, she goes in the house. And what does she take in the house? She takes her little lunch bag in the house and then makes a big a big deal. About, oh, God, she goes in there and says that, and she comes out. Makes me wonder what's in the bag, if there's anything in the bag that she shouldn't have, that she's trying to hide. So let me throw that out there in case uh, you guys decide to look into that. If this, <laughs> if the police department was looking at this, I wonder what was, in, what was in that bag. Think about that a little bit. Once again, we're seeing one of the lamest excuses in the world of why she didn't know that she was being pulled over because there were other people on the road, too. And she didn't think he was pulling her over. He said, I was right behind you, right behind her. And she's saying oh, there are other we'll cars on the road, time. too. Yeah. Then when she when she goes back in the car for her bag, let me tell you something that that makes Every police officer's skin crawl because that's never good. Where nobody says much about it. They just turn around and start climbing in there. If if that were anybody else, that would have been a huge problem. A huge problem because you never let that happen. All you had to do is say, turn around, where you know, you're done. Turn around. This is where, you know, you're under arrest. But he didn't do that. And the guy's being as professional as he possibly can. But he's riding that line where I can, this, is this going to get me in trouble or what? And then he says, I don't care. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. That's tough for, for someone in that position. So we're seeing a pro do his job the way he should. And she's just pooping all over him and making him feel terrible about it. My neck is killing me. This woman is giving me, you know, <laughs> you always heard a pain in the neck. I swear to God, I'm getting a pain in my neck. Um, then she starts stomping around and holds her badge up and stomps when she does that. Another giant narcissistic baby uh, behavior we'll see time and time again. Y'all covered the parts about anger and all that, but I think this is this is a beautifully presented example of narcissism at its highest level. When somebody gets a little bit of power and they've never had any before, this is what it looks like. When, it, when you hear the other oh, power went to their head, this is it. This is it. This is the kind of thing you see when, when a leader of another country starts killing all their their citizens in their country. This is the kind of behavior you'll see with them. This is the attitude they have. They're above it all. And and no matter what you do, even though us we're on the same team and we're we're working to make sure the law is is kept the way it should be. Nobody breaks the law. And if they do, they have to to pay for that. She dismisses that. She she doesn't give a hoot about this guy. Think she's above it all because she has the badge that says she's the DA, the DA. Sorry, excuse me. Hey. All right, anybody else got anything? No, no. Hey. Scott, you better stay out of that county. Oof. Yep, yep. All right, right. ma'am, come outside. You can't just go inside. This is a traffic stop. 
Here's Sergeant, your phone back. I understand the law better than you. Would you just 953, you can, can you have a law. supervisor come to the scene? No. Get out of my fucking house. I don't know why I don't know why you're acting like this towards me. Because Can you please go to the back of the vehicle? I'm not going to. I'm home. I was going I was okay, fifty. I don't care if you got home. You were supposed to stop at Phillips Road when I pulled you over. I when my know. lights were initiated. I didn't know you were stopping me. There was lots of other people on the road. I was right behind you. Yeah. There were I, other people on the road too. Okay. I was directly I'm behind not, you. I'm not dealing with you right Can now. Can you please step over here? I'm not going to. What is the reason you're you're so against what I'm doing? I'm doing my job. You say you're a DA? I am the DA. Okay. Okay, let me get you my badge. I am the DA in of Monroe County. I just don't understand the hostility towards me. I'm doing my job. No, you're being an asshole. How am I being an asshole? I am the DA in Monroe County. I understand yes, that. But I'm that doesn't give you a right to go to fifty five and a thirty five. And you even admitted to me that you went 50. I, I understand really that, ma'am. I don't really I understand care. that. I don't, you know what? If you give me a traffic ticket, that's fine. I'm the one who prosecutes it, okay? Just go ahead and do it. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just don't understand the hostility. I, I understand no, you're coming home from work. Making, and half the time I was on the phone with Dennis telling him, why are you pulling me over? You're not even supposed to be on the phone to begin with. You oh, should yes. know that. Oh, oh, oh. oh. I'm hands-free? Absolutely. Okay. You should know the law. Okay. If it is hands-free, that's great. But at the end of the day, you're going 55 and a 35. That's 20 okay. miles over the speed limit. Okay. You know what? That's fine. You know what I've been dealing with all day? Three murders in the city. And do you think I really care if I was going 20 miles over the speed limit? Okay. I'm just doing my I job. If you, pulled, if you pulled over when you saw my lights, which obviously you did... I thought you were going somewhere else because I okay. thought no one would ever pull a, a black SUV if you ran my plates. I didn't I run your plate. I just called your plate out. And then I'm following you because you're not stopping. So I had to take the air from dispatch. Just please. 953, you can have the air back, by the way. And am I hopeless is wrong with me? Actually. Yeah, when she turned, turned into that car ooh, and went ooh. for a bag... I Ooh. thought. I thought. Okay, I, this is going somewhere. I didn't. I was expecting a sh some kind of shooting to go on. Oh, taser, at least. Yeah, yeah. So it's the taser or some or. And he had every to, right to him to pull out his gun and like start instructing her. Well, and he has no choice. He can't de-escalate at that point because he's already called the chief, and the chief said, oh, "We got a super coming your way." I'm gonna get an Advil. I'll be right back. <laughs> I'm gonna do the exact same. I have a pain in the right side of my neck. <laughs> okay, it's just you and me, Greg, with no no ailments today. <laughs> I'm waiting for you just to leave. Well, I'm having a supervisor come because that's what my chief told me to do. I have out with five Yeah. Do you have your driver's license? I just showed you my driver's license. You show me your you show me your badge. Thank you, Jennifer. Really? When EMS, a 14-year-old having a seizure, 200 East River Road, Carmen 200 on the third floor. Because I was going 55 up close. Road and I was just trying to pull into my driveway. I was okay. on the phone with Dennis Kohlmeyer saying, would you please tell the person who's following me that I'm, just, just, I'm almost ma home? Ma'am, I understand you were going home, but I started my lights back at Phillips Road. Hey. I'm on Phillips Road, I guess yes. you did, and there are other cars. I was right behind you, directly behind you. <laughs> at, at the end, go, go ahead, like, at the end of the day, go ahead if you want to write me a traffic ticket. That's fine. okay. At the end of I the day, care. at the end of the day, I was stopping you for speed. If you I've just stop, I've had a really bad day. I've been dealing with murders. And I get in it. And I get it. We have I, bad I'm days sorry, also, ma'am. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We have okay. bad days also. I, I'm gonna just add it to the job real quick. Okay, You can just go and actually add it. You don't have to use the air. At the end of the day, I was just making a traffic sound, doing my job, what I was supposed yeah. to do. Well, fine. Thank you. Okay. So now, supervisor's on his way, and Who's then we'll the go from there. Supervisor's coming out here. Huh? Who? Sergeant Johnson. I understand you had it. Like, I get it. I, we all have I'm bad just, days at work. Yeah, I'm going to go in the house. 
Seriously, this is ridiculous. No, this is a traffic stop. And, I'm, and you, yes, out yes. of everyone, should know that if there's a legal traffic stop, which I have, I have the right to detain you until this is done. Then just write me the fucking ticket. I really don't care. Okay. Well, then just hang out at the back of the car. Because I'm the one that's going to prosecute myself. I, you know what I'll do with the ticket? Okay, just come out here for me and just I'm stand. Walking out there. I'm All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, look uh, to this baby point, Scott. You know, when you when you're an adult and you you're looking after kids, if you're a parent or, or the or the primary carer, uh, there's some some people would say what you're being is their frontal lobes because those haven't developed yet. So so kids up to a certain age really can't make very good decisions. And also, you know, what I've noticed with kids as well is suddenly they can become very antisocial, again, because they don't have the frontal lobes to work out, you know, exactly how to be social at certain times. So often as a parent, you have to be, you know, social for them and help them out with that and help them make better decisions. I think you're right, Scott. Uh, she needs an adult adult around her at the moment or some frontal lobes. Now, we've got to assume she has them because you shouldn't be able to... You, you certainly got to have some kind of law degree, I assume, to even yes. be put up for DA. So that means you've got to have gone to some college or university to probably quite a high degree. So she has frontal lobes. But where have the part of those frontal lobes that moderate her social behavior and her social compliance and her reasonableness, where have those gone right now? Like, where have those gone right now? So either they've disappeared because of emotion or alcohol or drugs to your lunchbox point, uh, Scott. You know, maybe there's something in there uh, that's that's causing those frontal lobes to go. And maybe she has uh, an affective disorder that means they've disappeared for, for a while, or maybe she has a personality disorder that means they're not really there in their fullest amount all the time, but she can rise to a certain level of job, but socially she's not going to be that adept. So maybe she's like this a lot of the time with all the people she works around, family and friends sometimes. Be interesting to find that out. Um, uh, Chase, to your point, I think this kind of nails down the social risk that's going on here. She says, I'm not going to walk out there. So yeah, clearly there's a problem with the neighbours and being seen, being interviewed by the police there. She'd rather talk inside than outside. Um, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree. And it, it, I think you'll be able to see all you need to do in terms of body language and stuff. And I want to give you one gift here, a gift. When you watch this again, uh, and I think this will change the way that you see the whole interaction. So if you're watching right now, here is your, your job as a profiler. I want you, when this video comes back up, to identify four traits of conflict management style showing up here. Uh, if you're up to the challenge, the first one I want you to identify is authoritative and commanding. So she's used to calling the shots, which is great for quick decisions but might make teamwork uh, pretty challenging at work. And in her personal life, this need to control stuff might lead to some issues. Number two, uh, doesn't like being challenged, especially in our personal life. This can stir up a lot of issues in relationships where compromise is uh, pretty important. Number three, uh, defensive when stressed out. This might lead to justifying actions without considering other sides. And this possibly affecting legal decisions. Uh, and this escalates conflict, obviously. Uh, number four, impulsive and reacts strongly. Uh, quick, impulsive decisions in her job could lead to mistakes or quick and impulsive can lead to ethical problems. These are just in general. Uh, and in our personal life, overreacting to small problems can create a lot of drama that's absolutely unnecessary. That's all I got. See if you can spot them all. Greg, what do you got? So let's think about for a minute, is it possible that we're seeing a symptom and a time, a block of time in this person's life that something could happen? Absolutely. So let's not judge and say this person always, always, because we don't know. We're talking about based on experience, what we're seeing in terms of body language and behavior. There could be a stimulus that caused it. 
And if you have an action bias, which she may have to get to that level of authority within a, a court system, then you're likely to respond more rapidly than other folks. Action bias is good in people and bad in people, depending on the job and depending on where they work. I'm an action bias guy myself. I don't sit around and wait for things to happen to me. I'd rather be responsible for them happening to me. That's a personality trait. And in corporate America, it is a strong, powerful tool that you need a mix of those guys and guys who are diligent. It works really well. So let's not brand with the person everything that we think. We're just saying what we're seeing today. But what we do see is that body language of defiance. Now our hands are on our hips. And I think you called this one the cobra, Scott. I call this the yeah. reverse cobra then because she's making <laughs> herself bigger to your point, Mark. And she has glaring eye contact and both shoulders going up. She shows lip compression. Again, that's containment of anger. And that fight or flight, let's talk about what happens. It doesn't matter how rational you think you're going to be. Once you trip over the fight or flight, now what was rational before starts to mock you because your plan and your plan of attack starts to go out the window and you're responding and you're reacting. You're getting that cat brain. That's what I think we're seeing here. And we see her go from defiance to helplessness when she realizes other officers have shown up. She sees those other officers. She switches gears and she starts actually to use social pressure on this guy. She starts to try to befriend the other officer, which I find really interesting. And I think she may mistake the other officer that comes up for the super that's coming that has hand this guy this guy's hands are tied now he can't do anything until the super's there except for hold everything that social pressure move when she says that's sarcastic and demeaning because i was going 55 is why this is happening she's trying to go back to a rational actor story with this person it doesn't work and then when she says who's the super coming you see that single shoulder shrug rise there's uncertainty i don't think she knows him and then she gets very pursed lips when he says who it is probably somebody she doesn't have a relationship with. And if you're the DA, you're probably hoping, hey, the person who's coming is Mark. It's not Bob that I don't know. It's Mark, somebody who knows me, and this will go well. And then fi finally, that single brow up in sarcasm, and just write me the ticket. And she laughs, and, and she says, "What you know what I'm going to do with it? Yeah, I know what you're going to do with it. You're going to put this on your sandwich, along with all that crow you're going to have to eat from all this interaction with this cop. Regardless of what caused it, this is inappropriate for her to beat this cop up who's doing a good, thorough job, and who has been very de-escalating in terms of what he can. His hands are tied right now, and he has to wait for somebody else to come and figure out what we're doing. Scott, what do you got? What bugs me about this one is when she says, I've had a bad day. I've had to deal with uh, three murders. And she, who do you think shows up to the murder and finds it and, and, is, is, and goes in first and goes, okay, shoot, here's what's happened. Somebody has to go through the details of that, not just be, being shown photos or a video of it. Who's there live first before anybody else before even know what's going on? That guy. That's what they do. And she's saying, I'm having a hard day. Don't give me that. No, I'm not. She needs to get... I'm getting too into I'm gonna have to hush, fellas. My neck is killing me. This is giving me a <laughs> literally a pain in the neck. Now, when she leans against the car, she stomps like a giant narcissistic baby. And then what she does is the classic covert narcissist move. When that other officer shows up, she, her head goes down, she gets quieter, and she's trying to make it look like the other officer is the one causing a problem for her. And she's not buying it. The, the, the officer that comes in is not buying it. She doesn't care. She's like, no, nope. she's, she says, I'm the DA. He goes, the first officer says, well, she's the DA. She goes, yeah, I know who she is. I know. Yeah, I know. And that's her cue to say she knows who I am. And so she starts that stuff, trying to, to get her, like you're saying, Greg, on his, on her side. That's, that's, man, that is, that's thought out. And that's that, that personality type. That's what they do. That's how they can, they control situations and make you look like. One time, Amber and I, Got in a head-on collision. A drunk woman hit us in in uh, in our neighborhood, near our neighborhood. And then there was a car that barely missed us. When I was turning, one guy ran the red light, and the second woman ran the light. When I didn't even see her, but I had stopped because I almost hit him. And then as we went forward, this other woman came through after him and just smashed right into us. And she was going fairly fast, but nobody got hurt. Right. So what happened was, and I looked at the guy, and I saw him, and I saw him go by. You know. And when he, when he um, when after the fire department, the, the police, everybody shows up, this guy shows up. She called this guy. He comes back. He's not driving now. Somebody else is driving his car. 
And he comes up. When the police officer is over there, he grabs my arm and says something. And then he turns around and walks off. And he goes over to the police officer and he starts talking to him. And, and the, the police officer comes over and he goes, didn't know I knew him. And he goes, hey, man, this guy says, well, what happened? This guy just says, you, you grabbed his arm? I said, no, man, he grabbed my arm. That's what he's trying. And he was the guy driving. I think he's probably, if he smell alcohol on him, I think he's probably drunk too. Because when they came through, he almost hit us first. So that's what he's doing here. They were together somewhere, bet you a thousand. Come to find out they were at a restaurant together and drinking real big. And they were both driving back to where they lived in our neighborhood. And he just got away with it when he ran the light and she hit us. So this guy's trying to get over there and start trouble and then blame it on me. So that's basically what she's doing. In other words, she's trying to act like there's something going on that isn't going on there. Oh, that gets on my last nerve. And then she goes back to not complying with anything at all, not even a little bit. So this is, y'all you know, have eaten up all the body language stuff. So I, it just gives me room to rant. All right, good? I thought yeah. you were going to tell me you saw two cars going the wrong way and then you realized you're on a one-way street. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for you just to leave. Well, I'm having a supervisor come because that's what my chief told me to do. Do you have your driver's license? I just showed you my driver's license. You show me your you show me your badge. Thanks, Jennifer. Really? With EMS, a 14-year-old having a seizure, 200 East River Road, apartment 200 on the third floor. Because I was going 55 up towards the road. And she's part of it. She's a DA. Yep, I know. And I was just trying to pull into my driveway. I was okay. on the phone with Dennis Kohlmeyer saying, would you please tell the person who's following me that I'm, said, just, just, I'm almost ma home? Ma'am, I understand you were going home, but I started my lights back at Phillips Road. I'm on Phillips Road, I guess yes. you did, and there are other cars. I was right behind you, directly behind you. At, at the end, go, go ahead, like, listen, you, you wanna, at the oh, end of the day. Go ahead, if you want to write me a traffic ticket, that's fine. Okay, at the end of the I day, really at the end of the day, I was stopping you for speed. If you I've just stop. I've had a really bad day. I've been dealing with murders And I get it. And I get it. We I, have bad I'm days sorry, also, ma'am. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We have okay. bad days okay. also. Okay. My last is bad. I, I'm going to just add it to the job real quick. Okay. Go. You can just go and actually add it. You don't have to use the air. At the end of the day, I was just making a traffic sound, doing my job, what I was supposed yeah. to do. Well, fine. Thank you. Okay. So now, supervisor's on his way, and Who's then we'll the go from supervisor's there. Supervisor's coming out here. Huh? Who? Sergeant Johnson. I understand you had it. Like I get it. I, we all have I'm bad just, days at work. Yeah, I'm gonna go in the house. Seriously, this is ridiculous. No, this is a traffic stop, and, I'm, and you, this out of everyone, should know that if there's a legal traffic stop, which I have, I have the right to detain okay. you until this is done. Then just write me the fucking ticket. I really don't care. Okay. Well, then just hang out at the back of the car. Because I'm the one that's going to prosecute myself. I, uh, you know what I'll do with the ticket? <laughs> okay. Just come out here for me and I'm just stand. I'm walking out there. I'm Damn. I'm good when y'all are. I'm good, too. I'm tired of looking at her. I don't know what the I did to my neck. I didn't. Scott, I'm feeling the exact pain that you are. Is it up here at the top and a knot? Yes. And down yeah. here. Yeah. Goes down my That's shoulder. me too. That's me too. We're having the same, we're having the exact same thing. Mark are and I are mad as you can be sympathetic. <laughs> are y'all? Yeah, you worked up. Your mind yeah. shows a little more than yours does on things like this. But man, y'all don't take Advil very often. I bet you Amber keeps it in the bathroom. I looked in the bathroom. I had to take Tylenol. I hate taking Tylenol. My poor liver. Doesn't it eat up your liver? Isn't that the one that messes with yes, your liver? Yes, it, it creates mm -hmm. concrete in your liver. Yep. Yep. Oof. All right, ma'am. So I'm issuing you speed that's, in zone, 55 and a 35. That's I'll take care of it since I'll be prosecuting myself. Okay. At the end of the day, if you see my lights and sirens behind you, and obviously they're going off, just pull over. We can have a conversation and be on our way. 
I kept my eye on your vehicle. I'm not going to check my computer to see what plate it is if a vehicle is not stopping for me. I want to keep my eyes on that vehicle for my safety, okay, so I make it home at the end of the day. Okay? I apologize, but... I, I, I'm sorry that you had a bad day, yeah. and I'm sorry it went this way, but I do respect what you do. Have a good day, man. But I would say, here's something else that Paul Dennis on this. You know the house... And I have your radio completely unreadable. Directly across from what? The stop sign of Phillips Road. Okay, I gotta put the job in. Do you know her location? Yeah. I believe she's trying to say she's at the Pier of Western Park. All right, thanks. All right, we'll see you. Thank just, you. He's just happy he's got company. Lake Road. All right, Greg, what do you got? So she's amused, sarcastic, and defiant again, and she but she barriers and immediately withdraws her lips when he's writing her ticket. There's uncertainty in her, but then she's back to defiant, and she starts to lecture him about who he should have called and what he should have done. Then you would know who I am. We're back to that entitlement versus expectation thing. Then she apologizes, but lectures him after the apology. That is not basic apology for you. When you apologize, you apologize, and you shut your mouth. You don't make excuses. You don't keep rambling. You don't come drag up something they did one time. An apology is, I am sorry I did this. You can say it was a mistake, but you don't make excuses. Excuses in the military, it's one thing that is deadly to a career is an excuse. As I always said in my intelligence world, there are reasons to exonerate you, but excuses will never fly. So that's always a way to look at it. I, there's large defiant chest, gestures, her hands are on her hips, and those exaggerated eyes again, back when she's, I'm entitled to better. Scott, what do you got? I'm going to have to pass because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm so worked up right now. I can't even see straight because my <laughs> neck hurts so bad. Chase, what do you got? All right. Something is very different here, and I think it's happening for two reasons. Uh, first, she's still defensive, displaying a lot of the same disdain for the law, which I would assume is rare for district attorneys. Uh, the same body language is here until one moment in this video, one moment, she clocks the body cam. And it's not that she didn't know there was a body camera, but I think she mentally processed that other people might be watching this later for review. The second thing that happens is the supervisor is standing there in the garage, somebody closer to her extreme level of importance. So her behavior shifts to more cooperative. Uh, this is a person who I believe, in my opinion, is consistently in image and impression management mode. And I say this not to make fun of her at all. And she may have had a bad day. Uh, but I think that we are probably seeing a, a behavioral pattern here. Uh, but as a reminder to everybody, that this whole planet is inundated with fake artificial misrepresentations of people almost 24-7 now, thanks to social media and all that stuff. People are starving for authenticity and realness. And this is one of the reasons that more people watch Joe Rogan than mainstream media. And it's, it's a good reminder for all of us that people are okay with flaws and it's okay to be just a human being. That's fine. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, we got flaws writ large uh, here. So, <laughs> so I think you're exactly right, uh, Chase. I saw it as well. She clocks the camera. And so there's a, there's a weird tension now between her still having these heightened emotions and her now trying to suppress those. And I think we see that coming out in the wideness of her eyes there, that tension there of not quite knowing which way to play it. And then she kind of starts to double down going with the same ideas, here's what you should have done, still plays the authority. I think even after she's clocked that camera. And so maybe she's going, okay, if I can increase my authority, some of the viewers of this or all of them will think, oh, no, she was in the right. That's the DA. She knows what she's talking about um, and and go go lightly on her. Uh, look, all I've got on this is is just more anger on I'll be prosecuting myself. So, so so, what that anger is about, I'm not quite sure. It can't be anger at the absurdity of a DA prosecuting 
themselves. It can't be anger at absurdity. So it must be anger at the situation. Or maybe, I mean, maybe this will pan out. There's maybe anger at herself. It's a possibility, especially, Scott, as you're saying, for a narcissist, anger at yourself could be, uh, and even if it's an affective disorder, if she has depression or something like that, you know, often some people say depression is anger turned inwards on yourself. So, so you know, maybe maybe there's some some reason for anger, and maybe we'll see that more. But Chase, to your point, impression management, yes, very definitely. And I think in the next video, we're going to see some of that impression management. So uh, let's have a look at that. Mark, what was your thing when you were saying one time is um, is a pattern? Oh, yeah, Remember yeah that? once is a pattern. Once that. is a pattern. It's a it's a behavioral, uh, I guess, um, model that I made up, which is because usually people would say, well, you've got to see something several times to make it a pattern. I think in human behavior, if you see it once, it's quite likely to happen again, or they quite likely did it before, but you didn't see it that time. <laughs> Anyway, it, it, I, Mark, I agree with you. It doesn't have to be that they do it every time, but this is not the first time she has been defiant. To your point, Chase, how you treat people who serve you food or people who have no authority. I, I, it's a good judge of character to me because it's back to the organism, right? If you've right. done this over and over and over, you will do it again. And you know what we're seeing when she clocks that body camera? Cognitive dissonance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see it. It's in liquid form <laughs> right there. Yeah. And it's palpable <laughs> that she can see like, well, I've I've done this behavior so far in the video on this body cam. I, that's the commitment and consistency principle that uh, Robert Cialdini talks about yeah. in his book. I have to remain somewhat consistent now. It's unbelievable. Yeah. All right, man. So I'm issuing you. Speed in zone, 55 and a 35. That's fine. I'll take care of it since I'll be prosecuting myself. Okay. At the end of the day, if you see my lights and sirens behind you, and obviously they're going off, just pull over. We can have a conversation and be on our way. I kept my eye on your vehicle. I'm not going to check my computer to see what plate it is if a vehicle is not stopping for me. I want to keep my eyes on that vehicle for my safety, okay, so I make it home at the end okay. of the day. I okay? I apologize, but... I, 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 I'm I sorry that you had a bad day, <laughs> yeah. and I'm sorry it went this way, <laughs> but I do respect what you do. Have a good day, man. But I would say... Okay, I got to put the job in. Do you know her location? Yeah. I believe she's trying to say she's at the Pier Buster Park. All right, thanks. All right, we'll see you. Sorry. He's Thank just, you. He's just happy he's got confidence. Lake Road. Let's see if you got a knot right here, Chase. That I found mine, man. That's helping. Yeah. That where yours is, too. Yeah. <laughs> it runs up to here. <laughs> yeah. Last Monday, I failed you and the standards that I hold myself to. And for that, I am so sorry. What I did was wrong, no excuses. I take full responsibility for my actions. I fell short of the values I've held for my entire 33 year career. I didn't treat this officer with the respect that he deserved. All police officers deserve respect. I am truly and sincerely sorry. I had just come from work. I was dealing with three homicides that occurred over the weekend. I watched a video where an innocent cab driver was executed and I was still reeling from a frightening medical concern that my husband received that afternoon. But we all had bad days and stress, and it was wrong for me to take it out on an officer who was simply doing his job. While I previously apologized to him, I will say it again, I'm sorry. Police already have a tough job, and that day I made this officer's job harder. To the community, I owe you full transparency. Here's what I'm doing to hold myself accountable. First, I already pled guilty to the speeding ticket and I will willingly pay the fine. Next, I'm referring the entire matter to a district attorney from another county for review and will fully cooperate with that investigation. I'm going to self-report this incident to the grievance committee and I will cooperate with their investigation. Finally, if one of my assistant district attorneys had acted this way, 
I would have disciplined them, so I'm disciplining myself. I will take ethics training to remind myself that professionalism matters. I've been humbled by my own stupidity, and I am fully to blame. I will make this right. I ask for your forgiveness. All right, I'll go first on this one. I've seen more of a heartfelt sincerity from a 15-year-old TikTok wannabe, um, what do they call it, influencer, handing me a cheeseburger that I saw in this thing. There's nothing at, at all. We were laughing in this. We said, I'm sorry. She's not sorry. This thing meant nothing to her. Nothing to her at all. We're seeing those eyes get all, <clears throat> all wide and her chin is up and it's jutted forward. And we're seeing these little micro expressions of anger and contempt and disdain. She doesn't feel anything she's talking about at all. If she felt bad, what we see is the body language of someone who feels bad about that and feels sorry for it. Her head would be down. <clears throat> her voice would be softer. We'd see a little bit of concern in the brow. We're not seeing any of that. And no, I don't think it's Botox because people always think it, it might be Botox. It's not Botox. Those emotions aren't there. So they're not firing off uh, in her expressions. So we're not seeing any sincerity whatsoever here. Uh, when she says all the officers deserve respect, we see a single shoulder shrug and then a, uh, then a real quick single shoulder shrug or a double so shoulder shrug. And those happen so quickly that me, that usually suggests the person is, is, isn't sure about their answer or maybe being deceptive. I think she just doesn't know what she thinks. I know she knows what she thinks about it. But she's not so sure she should be saying that at this point. I think she sees all um, police officers as peons just below her or right below her. I don't think she has any respect for him whatsoever from what we've seen so far. And um and and, and this isn't her first shot at this. You can tell us that she's given she's said this four or five, six times to rehearse it in front of the camera, not counting at home in front of the mirror in the bathroom. So I, there's no sincerity here. There's nothing here that's a takeaway that that would help her case at all, not even a little bit. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah. I thought it was interesting when we saw this strong chin jut when she's saying an officer doing their job. And that's a it's disagreement and in in a very deep form. Uh when she says last Monday I failed you, she's there you can see a micro expression of disgust on her face. It's not even micro, it's an expression. And I wonder about this shoulder shrug when she's saying all police officers deserve respect. This tends to indicate somebody's lacking in confidence about what they're saying, but she does this a lot in this video. So I don't want to cherry pick uh, that one statement, but she says she's sorry, then goes into excusing all of her behavior, which is just stunning. If you remember just three minutes ago, Greg gave you a definition of what an apology sounds like when somebody's uh, apologizing. And it's simultaneously an appeal for sympathy and an excuse for what happened right there. And she's saying uh, this frightening medical concern my husband received that afternoon. There's some strong lip compression and chin boss movement there. Uh, I'd love to know what you guys think of this, what y'all might interpret that to be if you if you saw the same thing. Uh, but I've got an idea. I think he gets sick when she comes in, when she shows up at the house. That makes him that makes him sick. So she got concerned about that. But that's just me. I'm a Capricorn. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's so many facial expressions here that absolutely do not match the words that she's saying. And this was initially researched by this guy named Dr. Paul Ekman. And he studied facial expressions and how universal and reliable they are as indicators of emotion. And he's known for micro expressions. But the majority of his work, like 90 percent, was not about micro expressions, but facial expressions as a whole and how they can betray a speaker's true emotion. And when she says, I'll I'll gladly pay the fine. I'm curious why there's a sudden frown appearing on her face, because you can see it plain as day. And this whole video goes back to our discussion of scripted, sculpted and curated content. And that's what this video is. It's. It's it's mainstream instead of the Rogan that we should be seeing here. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, it's a, it's a very different uh, way of producing um, content that's gone on uh, right here. And 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 to your point, Scott, she says, "Look, I, I've." She basically says, "I've apologized before, but I'll do it again." So she really doesn't think she should be doing this now. A better piece of PR would be something along the lines of. 
I will apologize as many times as it takes to win back your trust in me as a public servant. That's that's the way to go. Like I'll just keep on apologizing until you trust. And here's what I'll do to win back your trust. And here's what I'll do to win back your trust. Actually, do not go back on what happened, to, but to go on forward as to what the behaviors are you're going to do that's going to cause that electorate to now trust you as they should. But she doesn't go in that way. It's all about the past. It's all about saying that she's done something wrong, but really she shouldn't be... Um, she shouldn't be berated on it. Look, beautiful shot here. We've got a lovely bokered background there. It's, you know, it's a kind of in the, you know, it's kind of fuzzy in the background. Got almost a slightly Vaseline lens as well. It's, you know, she's got, she's really smoothed out the skin there. Nothing wrong with that. Look, there's nothing wrong with looking good on camera. Of course, you should look good and the environment should look good. But given what she knew the public had already seen, it's too much of a contrast as a piece of PR here. Beautifully lit as well. She's side lit on both sides, which is really making the most of the hair there. Looks fantastic. Again, nothing wrong with that, but as a piece of PR, it's too extreme. Be much better if she'd have been there in a more gritty environment, a similar environment, giving a really true uh, apology there. Where does she go with this? Um, I watched a video where an innocent cab driver had been executed. Like, why do we need to know that? I watched a video. So she's saying her excuse is, I watched a video, I just watched a video where an innocent cab driver had been executed. Well, that's well put together. An innocent cab driver had been executed. So that suggests that there would be some reasons why cab drivers could be executed if they weren't innocent of something. Well, that would be the only case of that would be a cab driver who's committed a crime in a jurisdiction in the US where there's a death penalty. And at that point, they wouldn't be a cab driver anymore. They'd be a felon and you'd be executing the felon. That would be a legitimate, to the laws of some states in America, a legitimate execution of somebody who was a cab driver. So there's information in here that we really don't need. She's putting it in on purpose because she wants us to go, oh my God, you know, there are some, there are some bad things happen in the world. People who, who are good people get falsely um, berated, falsely have bad things done because she wants to be in that same category as somebody who this shouldn't really be happening to. And there's an excuse. She's seen something that just should never happen. And therefore, of course, she's going to respond in a way that shouldn't happen. And therefore, this apology shouldn't be happening. There's a succession there of logic, which is uh, illogical. Uh, we all have bad days, she says. Yeah, we do all have bad days. But what she's doing is layering on this bad day so that we'll go, yeah, I have had some bad days, but never a bad day like you. I've never seen the wrong execution of a cab driver and then had news uh, about my husband, my partner in some way that's like, I've never had that. Well, some people have. I mean, some people have and they've had it worse. Like you cannot, you can't come in with that excuse. It never works. It never works to go, you know what? You have bad days, but I have the worst days. Scott, to your point, some people would call that narcissistic. Now, I don't know whether you'd be able to, you know, kind of say somebody is a clinical narcissist because of that. But it's it, but it's not looking good, is it? I mean, it's not as a piece of as a piece of evidence, it's not looking good at all. I, I could go on forever on this one because it's it's horrific. It's one of the probably one of the most horrific uh, apologies that I've ever seen. It's getting close. Uh, Greg, what have you got on this one? I always say people who make excuses make excuses. People who don't don't. I'll give you a great example. One time I was doing a carve out for a company. And we had to get all of these locations licensed, business license by a day. There's a guy, an attorney on the team who I checked in like on a Thursday and said, you're going to have all this done by Monday. Absolutely. Boom. Tuesday morning, we wake up and we're missing business licenses in 600 locations. <laughs> 600. Biggest mistake of my entire career. I picked my phone up. I called my boss and said, hey, you might want to fire me. Here's what happened. And he said, well, why? And I said, no excuse. It just didn't get done. That's a difference in a person who does that and a person who does this. And I really don't like excuses. 
if, if there's a reason something happened, that mitigates the blow. But you don't give, this is a minute and 30 seconds, give or take, you don't give a 25 second apology and a minute and five second explanation for why you did it. That's an excuse and that's all there is. If she had stuck with the 25 seconds of apology, this would have been fine. Hey, I made a mistake. I did something wrong. This guy deserves this. The reason I think you see all that single shoulder shrug, is she knows better. I mean, this is what she does for a living. She's dealing with criminals who make excuses all the time. And then my favorite in the entire thing is when she says everybody has bad days and her lips show her canines. That's pretty powerful. That says, why are you monkeying with me? That's all I got. Hmm. Last Monday, I failed you and the standards that I hold myself to. And for that, I am so sorry. What I did was wrong, no excuses. I take full responsibility for my actions. I fell short of the values I've held for my entire 33 year career. I didn't treat this officer with the respect that he deserved. All police officers deserve respect. I am truly and sincerely sorry. I had just come from work. I was dealing with three homicides that occurred over the weekend. I watched a video where an innocent cab driver was executed. And I was still reeling from a frightening medical concern that my husband received that afternoon. But we all had bad days and stress, and it was wrong for me to take it out on an officer who was simply doing his job. While I previously apologized to him, I will say it again, I'm sorry. Police already have a tough job, and that day I made this officer's job harder. To the community, I owe you full transparency. Here's what I'm doing to hold myself accountable. First, I already pled guilty to the speeding ticket, and I will willingly pay the fine. Next, I'm referring the entire matter to a district attorney from another county for review and will fully cooperate with that investigation. I'm going to self-report this incident to the Grievance Committee and I will cooperate with their investigation. Finally, if one of my assistant district attorneys had acted this way, I would have disciplined them. So I'm disciplining myself. I will take ethics training to remind myself that professionalism matters. I've been humbled by my own stupidity and I'm fully to blame. I will make this right. I ask for your forgiveness. Great. Uh, Chase, what are you looking at? A wasp in there? I got a bee in here. How did you oh, know? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of a bee? Language sure. expert? <laughs> what kind of a bee? <laughs> it's one of those big old fat bees, like oh, a yeah. would be. Oh. Yeah, no, let's get them out of there. Don't house. kill them. It's, it you. sounds like I've got a Cessna in here. Yeah, yeah. those things are loud. Yeah. Flying around. Burrowing bees. On the yeah. back porch. I have one of the back porch. Big huge. He goes, hey. That's because you drilled a hole in your porch. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they they're, do. They're, they're powerful little bastards. Yeah, yeah. yeah catch them. Go ahead and do it. Whoa. They're friendly. I don't I don't mind it. I was trying to figure out what it was. Can you get it? They eat wood. They eat wood. Yeah, they yeah. They've, they they've eaten the the banister out on my, my yeah. uh, out here. So, Sandra, I'm going to start with a question I think everybody wants to know. Sure. Why didn't you stop? I have no good answer for that. I, I regret what I did. I am sorry for what I did. If I could go back in time, I certainly would handle the situation a lot differently. Um, I, I, I wish I could say this is why I didn't stop, but I have no good answer. I made a mistake. What were you hoping to achieve by calling the police chief three times during that incident? So, so the context is, you know what, I work with law enforcement every single day. I have every single chief's cell phone in my phone. When I realized that the officer was attempting to pull me over, I wanted to make sure by calling the chief that he knew it was me and that I wasn't a threat. That first call lasted approximately 18 seconds. Can I tell you exactly what was said in it? You know, I don't remember. Um, was that the wrong decision? Obviously, yes, it was wrong. I made the wrong decision and I regret it. You were trying to get out of the ticket. At that point, I wanted the officer to know that I was not a threat, and I'm sorry for that. Why not just pull over and tell him you're not a threat? I don't have a good answer for that. I made a mistake. I was not thinking clearly. Um, it all happened so fast. If you understand, you know, the area where, you know, I first saw the officer to my house, it was a little over a minute. It, the whole thing unraveled so quickly. I made a lot of mistakes. If I could go back in time, I would certainly stop and handle it differently, but I didn't, and I was a jerk. 
You told the officer to, quote, get out of my house when he followed you home. You resisted his commands. You went into your SUV. You went into your house. And at one point, you called him an ass. Anyone else who did that likely would have been cuffed and arrested. I absolutely regret everything I said. I, 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 really, I really have no words for my behavior. You know what? I could tell you that I had a bad day. There were things on my mind, but really that is no excuse. I, I was wrong. Police officers deserve to be treated with respect. Me, of all people, I've been the advocate for that in this community, and I failed immensely. Um, I owe that officer an apology. I owe law enforcement an apology. Um, I, I, have, I, have, I have nothing else other than to say, I am sorry, and it wasn't me. That's not how I act. All right, Mark, what do you got? Well, there's plenty in this, but the one that jumps to mind for me is, if I could go back in time, I would handle this differently. We don't need to know that. <laughs> what we need to know is, going forward, what are you going to do? Because that just s s makes me suspect you'll keep on making these mistakes and then go, well, look, if I could go back in time, I'd fix it. With, with leaders, with professionals, what we need is somebody who makes the right decisions in the moment. That's what we're looking for, the right decisions in the moment. And if they make the wrong decisions, as Greg says, they apologize and they say, here's what I'm gonna do going forward to make sure I never do that again. She doesn't say any of that. She says, I don't have any good answers for this. And if I could go back in time, I'd fix it. That's not helpful for anybody. That's not a good leader. That's not even a good professional in any sense. Uh, we, we get these sneers of anger on, I made a mistake, I made the wrong decision. So what is the anger here? I think we could easily go, um, it's the anger of being interviewed in this way. I think it could be that. I think it also could be anger at herself around this. And I, I don't think that makes her any better a person that she's angry with herself because ultimately she should be managing her life a little bit better because of her role, because of her role in society, she needs to, in my view, she needs to manage her life way better than this and not get angry at herself around this. She needs to think, what am I going to do going forward on this? She's unable to lock eye contact with this interviewer, who I think is actually very, very good. Exactly what she deserves yeah. in this situation. Exactly what she deserves. Unable to lock eye contact. Her eyes are going all over the place. Um, uh, and I think because these questions have her reeling, which they shouldn't. She should know what questions are coming. She should have organized better what a good interview would be around this. Uh, one last thing uh, around this. <laughs> well, a couple of things. I could tell you I had a bad day. Well, you just did. You just told us that. That was like a covert humble brag that you just did. What kind of person would do that? I could tell you I had a bad day. You just did tell us that. So why are you doing that covertly to us? It wasn't me. That's not how I act. It wasn't me. That's not how I act. It was you. We saw you. I've seen the video. It was you. And it's clearly how you act. And you're not telling us that you're going to act any differently in the future. You're just saying, if I could go back, I'd make it differently. This is a disaster. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? Yeah. When she says she has no good answer, she's wrong. She has the right answer, which is all she has to do is say, I'm an idiot. I was so wrong. I had no right to talk to this guy. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm an idiot. I was totally wrong. And just throw it out there like that. That's all it takes. And that's a great start. And then I don't stop. Think, <laughs> yeah, just shut up. Yeah, because I don't, I don't think this is fixable at, the, at this point because she didn't make a mistake. She made a bunch of mistakes. Because th what she did was not a single mistake by not pulling over. That's one. She was speeding. That's one. She didn't pull over. That's two. She didn't do what the officer was asking her to. This is obstruction of justice. Do you ever think about that? Never talks about that. She never says, you know what, this is obstruction of justice. But I'm sure she said that to other people before because the officer couldn't do his job. She wouldn't allow that to happen. So she's obstructing justice. So she should get in trouble for that. I think that should come up as well. Nobody's above the law. And to prove that, they should show that, that she's not. The person who's supposed to be upholding the law over there and telling everybody what's right and what's wrong, 
that kind of thing, they should use her as an example. And she should say, yeah, you're totally right. I need to do my time, man. And she should. I think she should. I'm not going to be able to go on. My head is killing me. This thing is killing me. <laughs> Rick, why don't you go? That's an excuse. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> that's my excuse. Sorry, man. <laughs> go go ahead. I, 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 I can't. I'm going to hush. Greg, go for it. <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess so. So, yeah. look, there is enough body language here to show that she's feeling negative about everything that happened. But she doesn't. it doesn't mean she's sorry that she did it. It means she's sorry for where she's come to. There's a whole lot of stuff. There's grief. There's a grief muscle. There's disdain. There's disgust. There's all of that. When she says, when she's in there and she says, well, I'm, I'm an idiot. She didn't say I'm an idiot. She points out that I made a mistake. When she does that, you see that grief muscle. That's good. That's all good. But it still feels like it's about what has happened, not about being rude. At the very least, let's just call it being rude to a guy who's trying to do his job. And, you know, there's a famous quote Winston Churchill once said, if you have to kill a man, it costs nothing to be polite. That is a guidepost for my life. No matter how jerky you need to be to somebody or something you have to do, you can still be polite about it. That would have changed this entire outcome for her. Remember that in your life. Because you're having a bad day. You don't know what kind of day that other person's had. And if a person is tasked, back to your point, Chase, with authority and rank, if a person's tasked with doing something and you're making their life harder, you need to be polite at the very least somewhere in the process. She does drive home the point that I made to you earlier in the very first video. That she's being defiant when she opens her eyes wide because she doesn't open her eyes very wide, except when she's trying to drive a point. She shows some disgust at wrong decision. There's chin boss engagement at regret. We say that's another difficult one to fake. You know, few people can do that. Few people can do that. But it is a hard one to fake. Um, she, however, uses an absolute redirect when she's asked if she wanted out of the ticket. Come on, answer the question. She at least finally in the very end wraps the answer with I have nothing else. That's the right answer. You should have said, boom, I have nothing else. That's it. But people cannot let it go because their ego gets so bruised by being called stupid or an idiot or that kind of thing. That they have to re retort. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, she's uh, going back and changing stuff is never a good idea. I think we all know the classic example of Marty uh, at the Enchantment Under the Sea dance, <laughs> trying to change stuff around. <laughs> nice and done. Time. And uh, there's some emotional accessing, some downright eye movement, which indicates most of the time somebody's accessing some emotion when she's saying, I'm sorry for what I did. I think she is sorry that that happened. And it's truthful, and it's good to see something truthful. Her story about why she kept driving has changed, I think, five times now. And it's a huge amount of disgust when she's talking about police needing to be treated with respect. You can see the disgust on her face. And she and discuss just so you know, if you imagine everything on your face being kind of brought toward the middle of the face, squeezing into the middle, she digs in on the what looks like deception here. And what I, you know, I would say clearly based on what we saw in the body camera video, she's just digging all in on the deception about her story. Then she starts asking herself questions and essentially interviewing herself. Do I like when people do that? No. <laughs> is it indicative of deception? No. But it can indicate that somebody's misleading or redirecting the topic of conversation. And if I could go back in time, I would change. Uh, I, I would certainly do X, Y, and Z. There's a chin quiver there. And this kind of muscle activity, when we see a little chin quiver down here, this is, muscle is the chin boss. Uh, it can happen when somebody's trying to suppress crying or they're experiencing a deep emotional stuff that they're struggling to control. And she says, it wasn't me. That's not how I act. I thought that was, that was <laughs> unusual. I would like to see her respond to a defendant saying that, that she's prosecuting. Uh, in the comments, let us know if you think this might be a misleading statement. Was she simply referring to that behavior not being her public persona mm. when she said that wasn't me? That's not the persona. That's not the mask. Interesting. Well, let's have another. Yeah. So, Sandra, I'm going to start with a question I think everybody wants to know. Sure. Why didn't you stop? I have no good answer for that. I, I regret what I did. 
I am sorry for what I did. If I could go back in time, I certainly would handle the situation a lot differently. Um, I, I, I wish I could say this is why I didn't stop, but I have no good answer. I made a mistake. What were you hoping to achieve by calling the police chief three times during that incident? So, so the context is, you know what, I work with law enforcement every single day. I have every single chief's cell phone in my phone. When I realized that the officer was attempting to pull me over, I wanted to make sure by calling the chief that he knew it was me and that I wasn't a threat. That first call lasted approximately 18 seconds. Can I tell you exactly what was said in it? You know, I don't remember. Um, was that the wrong decision? Obviously, yes, it was wrong. I made the wrong decision and I regret it. You were trying to get out of the ticket. At that point, I wanted the officer to know that I was not a threat. And I'm sorry for that. Why not just pull over and tell him you're not a threat? I don't have a good answer for that. I made a mistake. I was not thinking clearly. Um, it all happened so fast. If you understand, you know, the area where, you know, I first saw the officer to my house, it was a little over a minute. It, the whole thing unraveled so quickly. I made a lot of mistakes. If I could go back in time, I would certainly stop and handle it differently, but I didn't, and I was a jerk. You told the officer to, quote, get out of my house when he followed you home. You resisted his commands. You went into your SUV. You went into your house. And at one point, you called him an ass. Anyone else who did that likely would have been cuffed and arrested. I absolutely regret everything I said. I, 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 really, I really have no words for my behavior. You know what? I could tell you that I had a bad day. There were things on my mind. But really, that is no excuse. I, I was wrong. Police officers deserve to be treated with respect. Me, of all people, I've been the advocate for that in this community, and I failed immensely. Um, I owe that officer an apology. I owe law enforcement an apology. Um, I, I, have, I, have, I have nothing else other than to say, I am sorry, and it wasn't me. That's not how I act. If you saw a body-worn camera video of someone in your position who ignored those commands, would you push to charge them with more than just a speeding ticket? What I would do if I was reviewing something like this, I would look at the whole circumstances. Just like we do every single you know, case that comes in the office, you've got to look at everything that was going on. you know. Um, and I think that's, that's what should be done in my case. Were you under the influence of any alcohols, any drugs, prescription or not? at the time of this incident? Absolutely no alcohol whatsoever. I left work at, you know, 520 and went right home. Um, no illegal drugs. I am always on prescription uh, chemotherapy drugs that I take, you know, at least three to four times a week. But not under the influence of any that is Nothing, nothing illegal and nothing that I believe would have affected, you know, my ability to make a decision. I, I, I was stupid, you know, Jen, I, there's, there's nothing else I could say. And I regret what I did and I'm really sorry for it. It looks like to the community, this is a clear cut example of rules for thee and not rules for me. I, I, I understand that, you know, especially with um, members of the community. You know, for example, white people and black people, we perceive, I submit law enforcement differently, the criminal justice system differently. But all I can tell you is as a DA, what I perceived my initial thought, actually, when I saw the police officer turn around, I thought he was going off to another stop. Then he got a call for service. And then when I called the chief, my goal then was to say, I'm not a threat, because I didn't want him to think he was approaching a car and not knowing what to in in expect inside. All right, Greg, what do you got? I love watching the reporter who is now condescending. Look at the contempt as she's asking those questions. She's like, and I love the fact her fingers and thumbs are spread in absolute confidence. And now she's picked up the pen and she's using it to baton. It is just a beautiful thing that she's going at her so hard. This is a great hard line of questioning. It's nice, nice job by the reporter. So now that defiant body language isn't there but her eyes are wide open, so there's a little bit different impact. That wide open thing, and she's not jutting her head forward and slamming her body. It's different. This chemotherapy comment is a there's sudden head a ploy here. There's sudden head movement, a lot of detail. 
that she needs you to hear. And then her chin is up, her body's kind of curled for, forward, and her head's back exposing her neck. That's a call. And at the same time, her brow goes up. And what I always say is request for approval. Those three things together are requests for mercy. You can't miss it. So using that language and tying all that together, I, I don't think you can overstate what she's doing there. She's making a point of you knowing that she's got something major, probably expecting a, co a question about why are you on chemotherapy or that kind of thing. Either way, then she does pursed lips and her brain just kind of goes into vapor lock. You can tell as she is accused of being above the law. She stumbles over words. She's trying to chaff and redirect and she almost steps in a hornet's nest when she makes it a black white thing and all of that. That could have been a really ugly statement for her. And she suddenly realizes it. she loses fluency. Chase, you call it losing verbal fluency. I think what's going on is she's trying to rifle around in her brain for the right words to get herself back righted. And you can see it because she doesn't finish one sentence and goes into the next. And then you see that single shoulder shrug when she's talking about him approaching a, a car. At, at the end of the day, the last thing going on here is a big request for approval. And she's doing up tone when it should be down tone when she's saying, I call the police. I call the chief to to prevent him from walking up on something that he didn't know. I don't believe it. I think this is more of her making excuses. And what we know is, I would say all of us, every one of us here is nothing but a two-year-old covered in hair and scars. We're exactly what the little two-year-old child that our parents developed. Whether that parent allowed them to be rude to other people and those kinds of things, and then they got away with it, and that organism continued to build more and more of that kind of behavior, then you get it. We make up excuses. We make a reason why we did something. Why did you break the cookie jar? Well, the cat was on the counter, and, and, and. And people do that progressively through their lives, and they make excuses, or they don't. And then there are places, Chase, I think I would say the two of us have spent our lives in places where excuses are not a tool. Excuses are a good way to get an ass chewing. The minute you start making an excuse, the heat gets a lot worse. And then you just say, hey, I did it. I'm sorry. There's a difference. Then everything turns back. I think the world could use a lot more of that behavior than rewarding excuses for everything I've done and all of those pieces. It just looks more like I'm asking for forgiveness than simply saying I'm sorry. Uh, Scott, what do you got? I don't think she saw this coming, this interview going this way. Didn't see it I'm coming out. She thought it was going to be the regular old lobbing things to her. Oh, tell us, you know, you said so-and-so when this woman gets up her hind end about this. <laughs> what are you, Greg, you, 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 uh, yeah, you, yeah. And, you and your friend, you and wow. your friend are going to get yourselves in a bind. Man, I tried to pull out up. of it too. Yeah, I can't do it, man. I can't think straight. My neck is killing me. Just say it wasn't you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Greg, throw it to somebody else. All right. Chase, what do you got? Uh, she says, yeah, I would look at the circumstances and everything that was going on. I wish... She, the reporter would have come back with. So if somebody has a bad day and they're stressed and they commit five crimes and then refuse to comply with law enforcement, is that okay since they had a bad day after you look at the circumstances? Should we all let off criminals that you've previously charged who were also having a bad day? Because she's probably put away a few people who are having a bad day. And maybe she didn't look at the circumstances. And I wonder what she's going to do when the next hundred people follow her lead and don't stop for police so they can make a phone call to the police and keep driving so they can communicate that they aren't a threat. I know somebody's going to do it, and I wonder how they'll be treated in that county, city, area, place. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I'll run a bit further with the racial bias uh, <laughs> issue, Scott. Uh, what she does there, which which she realizes she's going into a terrible place, is false equivalency. Okay, so what she's saying is, well, look, you know, there are these situations where there's racial bias, but that's not what's being asked here. What we're talking about here is, is there a bias if you're the DA? It's nothing to do with race. <laughs> it's if you're the DA, do you think? you might have a bias for the DA. Is that a possibility? And what would we do about that? 
<laughs> like then going, well, you know, there's black people and white people and they can be treated. Yes, they can. They can be treated differently. But that is a false equivalency. That is a different thing altogether. Very important thing, but a different thing altogether. And we're on the important issue right now of if you are the DA, do you have to behave in a way which is so much different than any other member of the public? And I would say, yes, you do. You have to be so clean, so clean, and you've got to monitor that 24-7 because you've got one of the most important law enforcement jobs around. So you've got to be so much better than, than you think you need to be or th than anybody else is being. And that should be why people vote you into that office, because they think you are going to have the highest levels of integrity, not just say you're going to have them, but you're actually going to have to have them. And if you don't have them, well, I don't see how you keep that role, but that's not up to me. That's up to that jurisdiction, I guess. But uh, I don't see how you keep I don't see how you keep that role and I don't see how an apology makes any difference. I can only see how you saying what you're going to do going forward has makes any difference. Um, we're laying down that, that chemotherapy idea to win uh, sympathy. Look, I mean, nobody deserves any illness whereby you get chemotherapy or any illness whereby you might use drugs which are chemicals in some way. And I don't know exactly what she's talking about there, but regardless, to throw that card down, I would suggest other people might think it's manipulative, and I might side with those people who think it's manipulative to do that. Um, nothing illegal and nothing that I think would have affected my ability to make a decision. So no, I wasn't using alcohol, and no, I wasn't using drugs would be fine. Just a no and a no, that would be fine. I'm not sure why we need that. Well, maybe we need it in order to move towards that potentially manipulative mood move of going, hey, uh, I want you to think that I have cancer. And maybe she does have cancer, uh, but she doesn't say that. What she does is to imply that, and she moves herself into that implication, and therefore it leaves us as an audience with a void. It leaves us with a void, and what are we going to do with that void? Well, I guess our, her hope is, is that we'll be more sympathetic and empathetic towards her. That's terrible. I mean, it's nothing, there's been no saving grace in this. If you saw a body-worn camera video of someone in your position who ignored those commands, would you push to charge them with more than just a speeding ticket? What I would do if I was reviewing something like this, I would look at the whole circumstances. Just like we do every single, you know, case that comes in the office. You've got to look at everything that was going on, you know, um, and I think that's, that's what should be done in my case. Were you under the influence of any alcohol, any drugs, prescription or not, at the time of this incident? Absolutely no alcohol whatsoever. I left work at, you know, 520 and went right home. Um, no illegal drugs. I'm always on prescription uh, chemotherapy drugs that I take, you know, at least three to four times a week. But not under the influence of any. That nothing, nothing illegal and nothing that I believe would have affected, you know, my ability to make a decision. I, I, I was stupid. You know, Jen, I, there's, there's nothing else I could say. And I regret what I did. And I'm really sorry for it. It looks like to the community, this is a clear cut example of rules for thee and not rules for me. I, I understand that, you know, especially with um, members of the community. You know, for example, white people and black people, we perceive, I submit law enforcement differently, the criminal justice system differently. But all I can tell you is, as a DA, what I perceived, my initial thought, actually, when I saw the police officer turn around, I thought he was going off to another stop. Then he got a call for service. And then when I called the chief, my goal then was to say, I'm not a threat because I didn't want him to think he was approaching a car and not knowing what to ins ins expect inside. Have you spoken with the police officer since this incident? I have reached out twice to try to apologize to him, and eh, the messages that I left were apologetic. I would like to actually sit down face to face and apologize with him because I think he, he deserves that. You know, I'm waiting to hear back from him. I want to move a little bit into the ethical yeah. questions yeah. now uh, of, of some of the things you said during the traffic stop. You said, 
go ahead, write me a ticket. I'm the one who's going to prosecute myself. You know what I'm going to do with that ticket, question mark? What would you have done with that ticket? You know, Jen, I said a lot of things that were, were not pretty and that I'm ashamed of and that I'm embarrassed by and I'm sorry for. But I, I sent the ticket in by one o'clock the following day and pled guilty because I was speeding. I think people might hear you say that and they might say, gee, have you ever fixed a ticket for yourself or someone else before? Uh, for my, absolutely, absolutely not. You know, I've been in local courts, you know, helping because we've had a DA shortage. And when, when citizens come into, you know, the, the court that I was in, I would give them parking tickets and speeding tickets if they took a defensive driving class. So I, I, technically, I guess I, I have given offers to, to people out there. I wasn't even going to get a special prosecutor and ask for that courtesy for myself. I was just going to, you know, take my lumps and, and pay my ticket. I had a clean license. Technically, the situation was an arrestable offense. That's what we've been told. You didn't stop. So it looks like you did get special treatment for being the DA. I, you know, I get back to, you know, I, I, I made a mistake. I'm owning that mistake. I'm being accountable for that mistake. And I'm sorry. All right, Chase, what do you got? This entire clip, the <laughs> whole thing, is filled with avoidance, a lack of answers to the questions. And I would bet something she would jump all over if she was interviewing someone and they behaved like this as a DA. And when she's asked if she fixed a ticket for herself or someone else before, she starts qualifying that question and specifically answering about herself only. And that makes me wonder. And I wish that she, you know what, she, you know what would be the perfect apology? And she can't do this now, but what would have been great is to go on like 10 hours of ride-alongs and wear a body cam the entire time and publish all of that. I think we'd be able to see a lot of character come out. I think uh, she would not only develop a lot of respect for what law enforcement go through every day, but the videos of those ride-alongs would help everyday people develop the same understanding. Wow. And she could, That's a she great could idea, help. man. That's a great yeah. idea. Wow. Greg, what do you got? Same thing. What I say all the time about police officers, people say they get dark and they get miserable. Well, do you want to know why? This is the DA they stopped and had to deal with this. <laughs> Think about the people they deal with every day yeah. of their life. It creates patterns. It creates difficulty. They sit in a the car. They eat because they're stressed. They gain weight. They have back issues. All this stuff. I have a very dear friend who is about to retire after 25 years, I think this week or next. And I've watched what happened to this guy. You know, this is a fit guy who's now got back issues and all those kinds of things. And he deals with jerks all the time. Well, what do you think that does to people? It makes you immediately more quickly respond to them with escalation and that kind of thing. And this guy did not. She should be very thankful. She could have been tased at the very least or worse. Mm -hmm. And then they would be prosecuting a police officer for shooting a DA somewhere in her network. You know, so there's a whole lot of stuff she doesn't do. She doesn't say, I caused chaos. I caused this. There's none of it. People are going to say our eyes are going here, our eyes are going there. This is a beautiful example of why eye movement is not reliable unless you know what you're doing. Because they ask a question about apologizing and her eyes go up and left and then down and right and all over the place. Because she's likely thinking of when did I call? How did I call? What did I say? All those things cause your eyes to move around a hell of a lot as you're trying to get information. And that's what most people think eye movement is. It has to be narrowed to a single sensory channel where you ask questions about what did you say? What did his message? You ask very specific questions. We didn't get that. She has an uplilt at he deserves that. But as she finishes that sentence, her lips purse, that's disapproval at the end of he, uh, he deserves that. That doesn't look congruent for me. And what we think is you're usually, your brain thinks one thing, your, your psyche knows it needs to say another thing, and your body is going to try to deliver what the brain is thinking. So that pursed lips is her delivering what her brain is thinking. There's a halting cadence, which is likely fight or flight. When she goes through here trying to say all of these things, she knows what she's supposed to do, and her ego may be saying, I really don't feel that or want to say that, but she knows she has to do it. She's mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of stuff here. I just will I, I go back to what you just said about her covering up and being evasive is all hell. When she's asked a really direct question, did you ever fix tickets for yourself or anybody else? She covers self and then moves on. And she eye blocks more than she's ever done. And she starts to chaff and run down that. 
then there's a real loss of eye contact. This is the one time that a myth may be true. When we always hear when a person makes hard eye contact, they're telling the truth and they're looking away. When a person's evading you and not looking you in the eyes, a lot of times it's because they're trying to think of what they need to say. And I think that's where people think it comes from a lie. In this case, she's rattling and rolling and chatting and putting all kinds of chaff out there. The one thing I do see, however, is remorse. I see remorse for the situation. I see remorse for whatever. It doesn't matter why it's there and we can see it. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. Um Chase, here's the reason I think she wouldn't go uh, uh, on those uh, rides with uh, police officers is she's already done her public service, she says, in that uh, she there's where there's a DA shortage, she steps in there. Um, so she's already she's already doing some wonderful public service. And again, she makes sure that she tells us about that. Well, DA shortage, I think there is a DA shortage, certainly with with her. She is short of some of the elements that, in my understanding, you would need in order to be not to be a great DA, just to to hold the office of of that, to hold that office before you even start to do a great job as that she is in a deficit of some of those things. She says, um, sit down face to face and apologize with him. No, you apologize to him. And you apologize to him. With him would suggest that would, 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 would suggest that he's going to apologize and then she's going to apologize. It's like a group apology. He did nothing wrong. There wasn't any element, from my understanding, that, that he did wrong. In fact, you know, he really held himself together in what looked to me and I don't do his job, but it looked to me like could be quite a dangerous situation. I really thought those videos, when I first started watching them, I thought they were going to go somewhere quite different and we were going to see some weapons coming out from somebody. So, so it was erratic what was happening there, given the circumstance, and I'm surprised it didn't go in a, in a horrible uh, direction. Um, well, that's all I got. That's all I got on that one. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. That's the first thing I have on, on my list is I want to sit down and apologize with him. And if she and, and he won't call her back. So here was her chance. All she had to do at that point was say, I want to sit down and apologize to him. And, I, you know, he, I can't get him to call me back. And then she should just turn to the camera yeah. and go, listen, man. I'm so sorry. What I was, I was being, that was her shot right there. Yeah. She had, she could have cleaned a lot of stuff up there. I don't think it would have fixed everything. It shouldn't, but it, man, it would have made her look a lot better. Some people would go, well, you know what? Maybe she's got it together. Maybe she's not mm. as bad as I thought. That was her, that was her window. And she let it pass by because she's thinking about her. She's not thinking about anything else except the way people see her and herself. So that's where she missed her. She missed her shot there. And when she says, um, what would you have done with the ticket? Then she tells her exactly what she would do because that's what a narcissist would do with the ticket. And then when she's asked about fixing tickets and she tries to get away from that, well, she tries to make herself look benevolent by talking about, like you were saying, Mark, like, you know, I'm the assisting with the DA stuff or helping the DA and all these other things. And I've helped people that have had problems. I'll let them take, tra you know, traffic, do traffic court and all that. Come on, man. She's not she's not benevolent in any way. She's not I don't think we're dealing with a person who who has that in them, except for things for herself. You know, I'm sure she's good to herself, but other than that, no, I'm not seeing any of that. All right. That's all I got. Oh, Chase, you win that one. Have you spoken with the police officer since this incident? I have reached out twice to try to apologize to him and uh, the messages that I left were apologetic. I would like to actually sit down face to face and apologize with him because I think he he deserves that. You know, I'm waiting to hear back from him. I want to move a little bit into the ethical yeah. questions yeah. now uh, of, of some of the things you said during the traffic stop. You said, go ahead, write me a ticket. I'm the one who's going to prosecute myself. You know what I'm going to do with that ticket? Question mark. What would you have done with that ticket? You know, Jen, I said a lot of things that were were not pretty and that I'm ashamed of and that I'm embarrassed by and I'm sorry for. But I I sent the ticket in by one o'clock the following day and pled guilty because I was speeding. I think people might hear you say that and they might say, gee, have you ever fixed a ticket for yourself or someone else before? Uh, for my absolutely, absolutely not. 
you know, I've been in local courts, you know, helping because we've had a DA shortage. And when when citizens come into, you know, the, the court that I was in, I would give them parking tickets and speeding tickets if they took a defensive driving class. So I, I technically, I guess I, I have given offers to to people out there. I wasn't even going to get a special prosecutor and ask for that courtesy for myself. I was just going to, you know, take my lumps and, and pay my ticket. I had a clean license. Technically, the situation was an arrestable offense. That's what we've been told. You didn't stop. So it looks like you did get special treatment for being the DA. I, you know, I get back to, you know, I, I, I made a mistake. I'm owning that mistake. I'm being accountable for that mistake. And I'm sorry. All right. Well, we've taken a look at this video and we've talked about it some. And I'm sure we've all made up our minds, made some decisions about what we think is going on. Mark, what do you see? How's it looking to you? Look, I'm just going to say one thing about this. We all have bad days, but some of us, I think, have a responsibility whereby we don't get to take bad days. And I think this DA, this DA shouldn't be taking a bad day on this one, shouldn't have taken a bad day back then. Uh, you need a level of integrity and, and performance whereby any day is not going to affect your judgment because you're being watched all the time. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so I'll, let's let's go into this. I think she is a well-meaning person who did not act with malice or any bad intent uh, while she was there. I don't think there was malice. And let's look at this behavior here. Why is why does this behavior exist? And how? why might it be flourishing in this environment? If you're a district attorney living in an extremely high conformity neighborhood, uh, which I looked into because the GPS coordinates were on the video, inside of a big city, this can do some crazy things to us, all of us. And one of the things that can happen is that somebody can unconsciously start living a performative lifestyle where they hide their flaws and their genuine uh, self-expression takes a backseat. And at the end of the day, the lack of authenticity kind of eats away at us as at all humans. And the lack of control, think about this as we wrap up this video, and the times that you see people acting like crazy a-holes in your life, the lack of control in that person's life causes people to seek out control in other places in, in their lives, wherever they possibly can, just to get some feeling of control. So typically when you see these spikes like this is a, a feeling of being out of control. So I'm uh, not being an apologist, but I kind of feel like one. Greg? <laughs> well, I, I will be, I, I'll jump on the bandwagon with you. Who knows what generated the initial interaction? But once you get to a point and you escalate to that level, the only way out of that is on the back end to say, hey, I'm sorry, I was a jerk. I created more of what you have to deal with every day. This is a case of displaced expectations parading as entitlement. I'm the DA. I should not have to put up with this is not a fact. I'm the DA. I broke a law. I have to put up with is a fact. And that escalation that occurred, we see it every day in people who believe they have entitlements they don't have. And they escalate and they get angry and they get spun up. And it causes more divorces. It causes more destroyed relationships and business partnerships and all of that because people assume something that really isn't true, that they're entitled to X. You can state entitlements, but expectations are a different thing and those must be negotiated. Scott, what do you got? In, in her situation, they're asking uh, if she'll resign. That's one of the things that, you know, are you going to resign? What's going to happen? She's not going to resign unless it becomes unbearable for her to stay there because her narcissism won't allow her to resign and say, I was so wrong. I've got to, I've, I've got to resign. And she'd never have an apology about the, to, to this uh, police officer or her constituents or the citizens or whatever if her job, if the power wasn't in danger because she's a, huge narcissist and, and keep in mind didn't... we don't use any of these words in a clinical sense or a diagnostic no. uh sense. No. right this is coming for an emotional uh <laughs> point at this time because my neck is killing me from this <laughs> and this is just my opinion just so you know and i could be wrong you know i could be wrong wrong a lot you know we all are 
So now I'm just telling you what I, what I think. It doesn't yeah. mean anything. So because I know what jurisdiction will get sued in. If, if <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So keep in mind, this that's, is just. And I know who'll do the suing. Feel. Right. This is just how I feel about it. So Scott she didn't. <laughs> yes, this is the way I feel. You're so true. She didn't. She didn't make a mistake. She broke the law, and she broke the law a lot. She broke a bunch of them. If you went into a bank and, and with a gun and said, "All right, I'm taking all the money. Let's all do this," and the cops show up. And you can't go outside because the cops are there. So you call the chief of police. And then you, 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 once you're in prison, once they do come in and get you and you say, well, I'm, I'm, I apologize. You know, I was calling the chief of police to tell them that I'm really okay because I'm sorry I did that, you know, and I'm, t I taught, I'm trying to, I've got to call into the tellers that were there. I didn't mean to scare everybody, you know, it's just, it was a fake gun. So I'm sorry I did that. So I'm going to, Y'all take it easy, and I'll I'll see you at lunch or whatever. I'll see you around. No, you're going to go to prison if you do that, and you should, and she should too. She should she should have to pay for it. She may not have to go to prison, but she should pay for whatever she's done. Because she's broken she's broken the law. Nobody's above the law. I think she should be used as an example in this case to show everyone that nobody's above the law because she sure is acting like she is. And one thing we need in America right now is to show us that nobody's above the law. And this is a perfect example of that. You can start small and work your way to the top. So there you go. Nobody's above the law. Not even her. All right, fellas. My neck is killing me. I think it was another good thing. <laughs> we'll see you next time. last office just different organization so what animals have you seen we saw two baby bears oh, oh man very nice very, very cute nice. keep your dog uh, away there's a mother previous, where that where those came from the previous owner fed them uh regularly oh we yeah that one there and you can just stand right beside them they don't care dude don't be doing that man <laughs> don't be doing bears. that it These doesn't matter are uh, you? So I, I'm telling. <laughs> damn it! Wait a minute. I have friends, Ron Chase, Hall. in I have friends in Wyoming that would feed grizzly bears grease in their yard and sit in the screen porch and watch them. I was like, Are you guys out of your minds? The grease runs out. There's a whole pile right there. You know. Yeah. Hopefully they had a fifty cal on them. Oh, they had guns. Yeah, for sure. Ah! Wait a minute. Is this the guy stabbing the, killing the bear with a spear? No, the black bear attacks him. Yeah, that's rare, though. That's really rare. No, it's not. It happens in the Smokies all yeah. the time. A little one as well. It's a baby. Yeah. It's a baby. Oh, the baby does. Yeah. That so, baby's probably that, trying to play. Give yeah, me that marshmallow. He's not. He's trying to give eat me that, that marshmallow. Guy. <laughs> probably trying to play, but uh, yeah. Doesn't Some matter. Size one would. 150 yeah, I mean, pounds of teeth. Yeah. yeah, there's only one thing you do with bears in Canada, which is stay out of their way. Yeah, <laughs> that's, man. That's it. Stay out of their that's way. That's my only fear is bears. They're so fast. Have you ever seen oh, one? I got more fears than that, but yeah, they're dangerous. <laughs> Not me, man. I'm afraid of nothing. <laughs> I've watched I've watched them run down animals in in Yellowstone. I'm headed to Yellowstone again in two weeks. Oh, yeah. And I've been within 40 yards of an adult. Yeah, I, I, I've been within 40 yards of an adult, but with the door open in the car where I could jump back in, you know, so I could get a good photo. Yeah, that's, yeah. Don't be doing that, man. They're fast. Well, there's somebody slower than me about 10 feet away. Don't worry. <laughs> but the thing there's is, a guy they in don't his care. 70s, I probably could trip him and get Let away. Let me tell you, they, here's what I know about that. They don't care. They zero in on one, and that's what they go after. That one. Uh, you, you, they'll run right by somebody who's running slower if they decide they want you. I, have you ever I, I seen that? I get up in this stuff. Have, and I've watched a ton of grizzlies. Have you ever seen the video where there's one chasing an elk through a forest? No. no. Yeah, the elk's running 35 miles an hour, and he's right on him. Bears can run 56 bear. miles an hour. That's how hey, fast they are. a little bit less roomy. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I have a giant mattress pad right here, so... That actually works quite well. Okay, a little yeah. bit less it's, echo. It's still roomy, but I, I I think I can get rid of that. I'll I'll see if I can pull that out. You know, sorry, so. 
I need more carpet in here. A bigger rug or something. Hmm. You get it worked out. It's just the mic. You just get them, you know, just get these mics we have. Look, you can't, probably can't hear this. Did you hear that? No, um, no not at all. Because no. no, cool. it knocks out all the, the room noise, all that stuff. If you want, I can set up my sure mic in maybe five minutes. Well, might be better because that that uh, your mic at the moment is not very toppy at the moment. It's quite kind of chesty. Really? Yeah. It yeah. sounds like different, different. It sounds it like sound you're talking to a phone like if that. If you got five minutes, I will grab it. Yeah, yeah go yeah. grab it. Don't rush. Go grab go. it. It'll be better. Do you want well, I can't believe he's wasting our time like this. <laughs> so what do you got? Thank <laughs> you.